Okay, thanks everybody for coming. So uh, we have Eric Sanferton from Purdue, who will be speaking at our colloquium about uh, topology and quantum computation. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. This has been a lot of fun uh, coming here, meeting people, and uh, hanging out in New York. Uh, I did a little digging and tried to find some interesting New York connections. Uh, maybe it's not news to you. Some of it was news to me, so uh, those will come up. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is just going to be kind of a high-level overview of you know these two topics and how they're related: topology and quantum computing. And for me, I really when I'm talking about topology, I usually think about three-dimensional topology. Right? So, um, and when I say topology, I usually mean what's sometimes called geometric topology, right? So, in topology, there's different flavors of subfields in topology, right? Like point set topology or, uh, you know, metric topology, things like this. But I'm, uh, I'm interested in geometric topology. That's where you study things like surfaces and manifolds and uh, uh, things that emit Ramanian metrics, but you don't care about the Ramanian metric. You just care about the underlying topological space. So um, those are the kinds of aspects of topology that are very closely related to certain ideas in quantum computing, relating to, what, to what's called error correction and fault tolerance. Okay. So um, uh, let's see. There we go. So yeah. So in a nutshell, uh, uh, there's kind of a two-way conversation here. But I would say one of these arrows is much more, much better understood than the other arrow at least in theory. Right? So I'll say, I'm going to tell you what I mean by quantum computation in, in a minute here, but uh, the, the big overview here is that topology can be used as a mathematical framework for doing certain things in quantum computing relating to the fault tolerance. So uh, the big issue with quantum computers is that they're noisy, so you have to implement what's called error correction on them uh, to, to extract useful, like, Algorithms on the quantum computer, and topology is one way to like understand, like to, to topology is one framework for, for understanding error correction. Uh, so I, I'll spend most of the talk talking about that at a high level, and uh, maybe much more intriguing. And it, it's a quite you know this this connection between topology and quantum computation goes back to really like the nineties, nineteen ninety seven at least, and uh, you know Alexei Kataev, a physicist in, in California. Um, but uh, ever since then, there's kind of been this converse question, which is like, well, topology can be useful for quantum computing, but is there, can you use quantum computers to do things in topology that, like more quickly than you, you could with a classical computer? And when I say classical computer, I mean just a computer like all of our computers in this room right now, right? Those, your, your phone or whatever. Those are computers that do not use quantum mechanics. So um, that's where we're headed. And uh, this is like a much more technical web of the interactions here. So uh, there's a specific part of topology, a specific type of structure in topology called the topological quantum field theory. And those are uh, like have a, a, a tight connection to quantum computation and, and uh, uh, fault tolerant quantum computing. And then like there's algebraic things related it's called tensor categories, quantum groups, things like that. And then there's physics things related called uh, topologically word phases of energy. I'm not really going to talk about this in any detail, and we'll return to this at the end of the talk, uh, just to give you the sense of where we're at. So uh, here's what I'll do. Uh, just some background. I'll tell you about quantum mechanics. I won't assume you know what quantum mechanics is, uh, and then what it means to have a computer that uses quantum mechanics. And uh, then we'll say a little bit about you know the, the parts of topology I have in mind, namely knot theory and uh, top of quantum field theory. And then I'll dig in, this is the meat of the talk. This connection between topology and quantum computing is, is, related by, is, is motivated by error correction. Uh, so I'll show you uh, probably the most famous example of a quantum error correction code. It's called the toric code. And it has something to do with a torus, right? Like a donut, um, as a topology of a torus. So um, then after that, I, I, very quickly, this last section, I'll, I'll address this converse question, like, well, is there are there things quantum computers can do for topology that classical computers can't. So, uh, any questions about where I'm headed? Uh, any, any concerns? So, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the axioms of quantum mechanics to you. Uh, and uh, uh, so, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. I don't have a board I can write on, I guess, but um, I will be happy to try to explain. So, um, so, what is quantum mechanics? For me, it's a mathematical theory. 
okay, in the sense that there's a set of axioms that describe this mathematical theory, and I just take those as on faith. Okay, I'm not a physicist. Uh, I don't really know why these are the correct axioms, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. I don't have to, right? They're, they're, they've existed for about 100 years. It's mostly a bunch of German and Austrian people, like back in the 1920s, like defining quantum mechanics as a mathematical theory. And I think the key thing to remember is that it's not really a theory of physics. It's a theory of probability. Okay, so it's a theory where you have you, it's a type of generalization of probability theory where you, probabilities are no longer just numbers between zero and one. Probabilities are actually complex numbers. Okay. So, uh, 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 so I guess I said that. So uh, this really goes back to work of Einstein in 1905. Uh, this story. Uh, Einstein did a lot of important stuff in 1905. Uh, it's called a miraculous year, uh, usually, but uh, 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 this is what just one of those things he did in 1905 is uh, he was he was trying to address something called the photoelectric effect, which is there's certain materials where if you shine light at them, they 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 send off electrons, right? And those electrons, you you notice you're shining light at them, and back in 1905, people thought light was a wave. Right, that light, like the way light behaves, was by some wave propagating through space. And so, what you would expect is if a wave is hitting the surface, then the electrons being kicked off should probably also be a wave, right? But Einstein said, no, that doesn't happen. Experimentally, it doesn't. The electrons that come off are always come off in discrete charges, they're quantized. So, his response was like, okay, if we're shining light and we see electrons bouncing off, then presumably the light is not actually a wave, the light is actually particles. Because they're called photons or photons now, right? So, um, uh, but he wasn't taken very seriously at the time, okay? Because everybody thought light is a wave, right? Um, you can do these diffraction experiments where you 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 have like a light source over here, and you have a wall with two slits in it, and you see the light; it will interfere exactly like if you have waves rippling, they would interfere. You get an interference pattern on the on this opposite wall here that looks like that, where you have bright spots and dark spots because of the interference of the waves. Okay, so those, in 1905, everybody thought of light like that. Okay, they didn't take it very seriously. But uh, he was correct. <laughs> What's going on is not, a, not light is in fact a wave, but it also behaves like a particle. Okay, so this is this is a double slit experiment, right? Um, so very roughly what this means is if we go back here, if you just let the light propagate without paying any attention to what's going on here, this is exactly what will happen. You get this, this interference pattern. But if you release only very small amounts of light at a time, and you and you look, oh, which slit is it going through, right? Because when you're thinking of it, like if you have a single light source over here that's behaving like a wave, it's going to go through both, right? But if you pay attention to which one it goes through, uh, you no longer get that interference pattern, right? This interference pattern here is the bottom one there. Okay, but if you pay attention to which, which slit the light is going through, you get the top pattern, the single uh, uh, dual part. That's a slight, but you get something like that. Okay. So, um, and the cool thing was, what I didn't realize, so this was in 1927, uh, that this was confirmed uh, by Davison and Werner. So they won a Nobel Prize for this. And uh, I, I guess I knew they did their work in America, but I, uh, until this morning, I, I did not realize that um, they actually did it in Manhattan, okay, at Bell Labs. <laughs> so uh, uh, there's a plaque apparently somewhere down in the meatpacking district uh, on the original Bell Labs building. Uh, so that's where they did work. Uh, so they basically confirmed that light is both a particle and a wave. Confusing, yes, but uh, that's our reality. So we got to deal with it. Um, Okay, so quantum computing, what is this about? Uh, I'm going to say more about what quantum mechanics actually is in a second, but uh, we'll be up to this idea. The idea of quantum computing is to, well, build a computer that uses quantum mechanics in some fundamental way. Okay. And, you know, just to back up for a second, you know, the way our computers work, this computer, my phone, the phone in your pocket, right, they have things called transistors in them. And, the transistors, okay, they are interesting, like weird, like material science goes into them that involve some quantum mechanics a little bit, but 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 roughly speaking, we can approximate a transistor is just a switch. It's either on or off, right? And the magic is you're using electronics to implement that in a way that doesn't have to be 
move the switch, right? That's interesting, but uh, we can just approximate it as mathematicians as either on or off, right? And, um, and, and with quantum mechanics, you can have things in superposition of on and off in a way I'll make precise in a second. So uh, that's what you want to take advantage of with a quantum computer. Uh, so you want to have things like transistors that aren't just on or off, they're, they're in a mixture of on and off. So, uh, and something to bear in mind here, like I said at the top, uh, quantum mechanics is, is fundamentally a probabilistic theory. So quantum computers are, are a type of generalization of, of probabilistic computers, right? So you can imagine if I, if I'm, I can run an algorithm on this computer over here, it's, maybe it's solving some problem using some C++ code or something. And along the way, it might use randomness, right? For instance, by like using a pseudo random number generator to like, as, as part of the process of implementing the algorithm. So, so there's something like that that's always going on on a quantum computer. They are intrinsically probabilistic, but um, they, uh, uh, yeah, so they're like a generalization of, of, of classical probabilistic computers. And uh, uh, so this idea of using quantum mechanics uh, to build a computer kind of goes back to this young fellow from in Queens. Uh, I'll let you, uh, maybe he's familiar, maybe he's not. Uh, he's quite young here. Um, He's a little less young here. Uh, you might be know the guy on the left. Anyone know the guy on the left? That's Oppenheimer. You might know the guy on the right too, right? But uh, the guy on the right here, he was 23, uh, fresh out of his PhD. Uh, he was in New Mexico helping Oppenheimer do uh, big bad stuff. And uh, but uh, uh, this is Richard Fine, right? So uh, he wound up getting a Nobel Prize in the 60s uh, for stuff not related to quantum computing, related to like the standard model um, of particle physics. But uh, later in his career, in 1981, he, he came up with this great idea of like, well, we should use quantum mechanics to, do, to build computers because we could probably do some new stuff. And he's totally right. And uh, so, especially since the 90s, people uh, have really been trying to make this happen. So. Um, so what is quantum mechanics? Uh, like I said, there's a list of axioms. Uh, uh, it's really a mathematical theory, and uh, there's four axioms. Okay. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to take you through them. Uh, they're usually presented in a different order, but uh, uh, they basically have to do with linear algebra. This is what's so intriguing about quantum mechanics. It's basically a way of interpreting linear algebra over complex numbers as some kind of generalization of probability theory. So um, Axiom one, what's it say? It says if we have a closed quantum system, you know, I have a box and there's something quantum mechanical inside that box, then what the axiom is telling me is how to describe the possible states of that system inside the box. And it's by a Hilbert space. Okay, so, so V here is a Hilbert space. Um, and, uh, you, know, the, you know, the different possible configurations of the quantum system are exactly vectors in that Hilbert space. With one exception, the zero vector in that Hilbert space, we're not allowed to think of that as a state. That's not a valid state. Okay. So um, for those who maybe are unfamiliar, so a Hilbert space is the type of vector space, mm -hmm. right, over the complex numbers. And it has an inner product, uh, like a dot product, if you will. But it's weird. It's, it's only half linear. There's like a weird conjugation involved. Like, you don't know what I'm talking about. Right so um, I'll explain this picture in a second. Uh, this is from your chat, of course. So, um, so, so maybe the most important example for quantum computing of, of, a, of, a, of a quantum system is, is an abstraction. It's called a quantum bit, right? So, so a classical bit, just like a transistor, we can model abstractly as something that's either on or off, it's either zero or one. A quantum bit is something we model abstractly as something that can be in an arbitrary superposition of one and off, zero and one. So what that means is a qubit it's by definition, it's a, it's a Hilbert space that's two-dimensional. Okay, so it's a two-dimensional vector space over C, and we usually think of it just kind of formally for us. This is called the uh, Dirac straw notation. We can just treat it as symbols, right? So we're defining this vector space as being spanned by this symbol and that symbol, like off and on, essentially. And if it's spanned by this, then what that means is a, a vector in here, what it looks like is a linear combination, right? Of, of these two symbols, where alpha and beta here are complex numbers. So, and now uh, this has to be a Hilbert space, right? I need an inner product. So, what this is telling you about the inner product is it's basically telling you these two symbols form an orthonormal basis. And from there, it's enough that 
you can understand by the linearity of the inner product, like what, what the inner product of any two vectors is supposed to be. So, uh, so just this is what a generic state looks like. You have to pick out one beta, right, complex numbers. But uh, a specific one would be this one, 0 plus 1. Okay. And this is a state that we think of as being in a superposition of both on and off. Which, if you've ever heard of the Schrodinger's cat experiment, that's exactly what's going on. You have this poor cat in a box. Schrodinger is being really mean to it. <laughs> like there's there's some experiment where like uh, you set it up so that the cat like there's some quantum mechanical thing going on where the where like if if it were zero then the cat would be dead and if it were one the cat would be alive. But because it's happening in the box and you haven't looked into the box yet, the cat is what's called in a superposition of both dead and alive. Okay, so it's kind of just this thought experiment. It's, it sounds crazy, and it kind of is, because we don't actually observe quantum mechanical phenomena at far scale, right? Like cats don't behave like quantum things, but uh, it's an interesting thought. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the first axiom. Uh, uh, we can visualize now uh, with a little bit more work. I won't exactly explain now, but an arbitrary quantum state over here, right? One of these things. So it turns out, right, we're not allowed to pick the zero vector, so we can't have alpha and beta both be zero. And moreover, well, there's some some of these states we can't distinguish from, from each other for certain reasons, having to do with measurement. And what that means is that we can visualize the set of possible states of a qubit as living on a sphere. Okay. So what, this is called the block sphere. And what's going on is that so it's just you know the different sides are points on this sphere. Uh, the different places out alpha and beta essentially give you points in the sphere. And uh, you know, this is the off, this is the one, and any other point in between is in some mixture of off and on, some superposition of off and on. So um, and the point is to compare this, this is this is it's not just classical probability theory, right? If it were classical probability theory, what do we have? If I had a bit, a single bit that was either on or off with some probability p. Maybe it's maybe it's zero. Maybe it's one with probability p and zero with probability one minus p. The set of possible values would form an integral, right, and not a sphere. We, we're getting a sphere because there's something really fundamental going on with the complex numbers. Okay. Um, so so you know this is boring. Is kind of what I'm getting at here. Uh, this is like it's just a line, right? But this is the whole sphere. What's going on there? There's a lot more quantum states on on a on a qubit than there are like probabilistic states on a bit. Okay. Uh, and for what it's worth, if I had a deterministic bit, that's something that is either 0 or 1 with certainty. It's not a mixture of 0 and 1. That would just be the set 0 and 1, right? And so it would be like the endpoints of that 0. That's even more. <laughs> right? So, uh, But the others you observe as total? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, like all classical information is described by strings, you know, lots of yeah, many bits, but they're, they're just those two points. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to throw it under the bus, right? Like, the, the, all these computers are classical. They, they, use, they use old school classical bits, but they're still, that's still, of course, important. So, um, all right, so that's the first axiom. Are there any questions about the first axiom? This is okay. Okay, so the, the fourth axiom, I'm jumping to the fourth one because I think it's a little easier to understand. Uh, uh, before we introduce the second one, in fact, uh, tells you what happens when you have a quantum system that consists of multiple subsystems. So I have a quantum system over here in a box. I have another one over here in a box. I know this thing, if this is system A, has a Hilbert space, call it VA, and this thing has a Hilbert space VB. What this axiom is telling you, if you look at both of them and you put them inside a box together, the Hilbert space is the tensor problem. A certain construction in linear algebra. Um, so an example here would be an n qubit memory, right? After all, like even classically, right? We don't care about a single bit; we care about lots of bits. And on a quantum computer, we're gonna we're gonna care about having lots of qubits, right? And you, we're gonna think of having if I have n qubits, that's like a memory, a quantum memory with with n qubits, right? So like on this computer, you know, it's probably got you know, a gigabyte of memory, right? A gigabyte of storage, and uh, well, a byte is eight bits, so that's like eight gigabits, right? Uh, so many, many, many millions of bits. Uh, what's a giga? It's a billion or a trillion? It's, it's a lot of bits, right? So, uh, so we, we're, we're going to want to have quantum computers with 
numbers of qubits on that scale eventually. Okay. Um, so, so if we follow the, the axiom that it says, well, if I have, let's ignore this for a second, there's one qubit, there's another, there's another, there's another, there's 10 of these, and I have to tensor, tensor them all together. And just a short now, I'll write that like this. So I shouldn't have run this either. But, um, so, so this is what the state space of n qubits looks like. And uh, maybe an interesting thing to note is that as a vector space, this thing has dimension 2 to the n. Okay. So this is, you only have n bits, but they, the, the dimension of the state space is exponentially large. Okay. And we can think of this as being spanned. If a bit was spanned by a single, a qubit was like a superposition of a single 0 and 1, then n qubits can be in any superposition of arbitrary bit strings of length. So uh, this is sometimes described as a curse of dimensionality in that like, well, if I have an n qubit system, the set of possible states is gargantuan. It's exponentially large in terms of the number of qubits. But in fact, that's also a source of power for quantum computers because it means you can, you can try to exploit this exponential size of the state space to do new things and implement, create new algorithms that you couldn't possibly create on a classical computer. Um, so that's axiom four. Um, axiom two tells you what are the valid ways to manipulate a quantum system, essentially. Okay. And um, in the sense that if the quantum system is in this, you know, this hypothetical box I keep waving my hands around, um, if, if I don't look inside the box, but I know stuff's going on in the box, what this axiom tells me is that that stuff must be affecting a unitary transformation of the quantum space. Okay. So, uh, so what do I mean? This is the state space. The, the, you know, the thing in the box uh, looks like a vector in here. And if, as time is evolving, uh, that's, that state will undergo uh, a, a, an evolution to become a new state. And what we're saying is that that new state has to look like the application of a unitary transformation to that quantum space. So in here, unitary, what this means is it's a linear map from this vector space to itself. That's a bijection, right? It's, a, it's an invertible linear map, determinant one, if you will. Uh, and uh, unitary means something even stronger. It means it preserves all of the inner products between things. Okay, so that's the axiom. Here's an example. Um, uh, so classically, what do computations look like? Just like abstractly, right? We might start with some state of our memory, which is just, you know, we have three bits here. That one's zero, that one's one, that one's zero. And then a calculation, like at the end of the day, what the computer is doing is running these bits through elementary circuitry. And that elementary circuitry is doing things like taking the and of these two bits, zero and one, the and of that is a zero. Or one and zero, the and of that is a zero. But zero, that's a not gate. So this is these are and gates, not gates, and or gate, and gates. So this is like a very abstract elementary model of what the computer is doing at the end of the day in the circuitry. So so quantum computers are going to do an an analogous thing to this, okay? But there's a complication, which is that when we're manipulating the, the memory of our quantum computer, we can only use unitary transformations, okay? Whereas here, you know, these, these bits, we can operate on them with like and, right? So the function and, it takes two bits, in this case, zero and one, and returns one bit. So that is not a bijective function, right? The domain of and has size four, whereas the, the target has size two. So it can't, you can't possibly implement AND using a unitary. So you, you run into this immediate trouble, which is like, what the heck would it mean to compute? Like, if I can only compute with reversible functions. Okay? And it turns out you can deal with it. So in fact, any computation you can do on a classical computer, you can in principle, in theory, we don't even have quantum computers yet, but in principle, you could run them on the quantum computer. Okay? So but what does a quantum calculation look like? Well, it's a generalization of this to a unitary setting, where uh, it's called a quantum circuit. So it'll look like this. Um, so we read this this way. Each of these strands represents a qubit. And uh, each of these little operations, so what this, is, what this means is like, do something with these two qubits. This is do something with these two qubits. This here is just do something with this one qubit. Here is do something with these two qubits. So time is like going this way. And this is implementing a calculation. Now, I didn't tell you what the input is. The input can be an arbitrary state of qubits, and it's going to run it through the circuit and output a new state of qubits. 
So it's those things, quantum circuits, that are going to do our calculations for us at the end of the day. What a quantum computer. Um, OK, so axiom three, uh, I did axiom four second, right? So this is the last one for us, um, uh, is the axiom of measurement. And it really is, I would say, the subtlest axiom. Um, and uh, I'm not going to define it. Uh, it's, it would take a lot of text on the page, and I don't think it's necessary. So, uh, but very roughly, what what the axiom of measurement is telling you is how to extract classical information, in other words, bits, from quantum information, qubits. Okay, and uh, you know, so you have to define things like observables and measurements and outcomes and things like that. And and what's cool is it all just uses linear algorithms. <laughs> it's uh, pretty nice, um, but I, I don't want to get too bogged down. So uh, I'll just comment that uh, you know measurement is really important for quantum computing, okay? and understanding how it comes up is uh, well, maybe not understanding how it's involved can be the source of a lot of confusion. So I will do my best to you know I'm not defining it very carefully, so I'll do my best not to propagate uh, any uh, bad intuition here. So, but let me give an example. So, uh, because roughly on a quantum computer, the only measurements we ever have to perform is asking a qubit, are you zero or are you one, right? So, so a qubit, right, it's in some superposition of zero and one. It's, it's zero and one with different probabilities, but at the end of the day, we want a specific value, right? We want a zero, we want a one, we want a yes or a no. We, we can't just have, we're like classical creatures. We don't know how to interpret quantum I don't, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have to, maybe, maybe like a whale does how to think quantumly or something, but, but I, don't, I don't think that I, I can. So, um, so, so we have to measure our qubits to get classical information. And so if I have a qubit that looks like this, remember this is what an arbitrary state of a qubit looks like, what I can do is measure it in the computational basis. So these two symbols, 0 and 1, they're a basis of this silver space, and that's called the computational basis. And what this essentially asks is taking the qubit that's in this state and asking, hey, you, are you zero or are you one? And what's interesting is that it, it's going to say zero, it's going to say, oh, I'm zero or, I, or I'm one, not with any deterministic properties, but with some probabilities. And the probabilities are determined by these parameters by that point. So what's interesting is like, I have this qubit and I'll ask you, hey, are you zero or one? If it says, oh, I'm zero, then you know, the probability that it was zero is going to look like that, but I don't know what this probability is directly, right? Alpha and beta might be hidden to me. I might just know, I might just have psi in my hand, but I don't actually know what alpha and beta are. So I can ask you, are you zero or are you one? And if it says zero, then all I really know is that alpha can't be zero. <laughs> but if I have many copies of psi, 100 copies of psi over here, I could ask them, are you zero or one? Are you zero or one? Are you zero or one? They'll each report back so I can approximate these probabilities. But I just never see alpha and beta directly. And that's part of the subtlety of what quantum computers are doing. That sounds like a complication, and it sounds like it would make life hard. But in fact, not knowing what alpha and beta are is exactly what you have to take advantage of if you want to have interesting quantum algorithms. So, um, so here's a very concrete example of this case. Let's look at this state 0 plus i1. Okay. I can ask you, are you 0 or are you 1? And if you plug it into this formula, it's going to say 0 and 1 with equal probability. Okay, so maybe a more interesting case, kind of mashing up multiple of the previous axioms. Let's look at a state on two qubits. We'll look at this state, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. This is sometimes called a Bell state because this guy Bell did thing for them back in the 60s. And, um, or an EPR pair, if you want to be fancy. But um, the, what's interesting is if I, I have two qubits, right? If they're, if they're in this state, and I ask the first qubit, are you zero or are you one? And it says, oh, I'm one. And then I go ask the second qubit, are you zero or, or, or are you one? If the first one said I'm one, the second one will always say I'm also one. They're correlated. Okay. And that's another source of power in quantum computation. This this really freaked out Einstein, right? If you ever have heard this phrase, oh, like God is a whole dice, or like, uh, you know, there's no spooky action at a distance, like it had to do with so there's no actual contradiction in reality there. It's just uh, just strange. Yeah. So I could say more about it, but I won't make sense. Um, well, any questions? These are all the axioms. There's a lot. There's a lot there. You know, I, 
uh, <laughs> you could spend a whole semester learning these things in, in detail. But... Okay, so why all the fuss? Why why am I why am I making you learn all these things? So while well, I'm not trying to make you do this, but I think it's really cool. And uh, what's really cool is that when you build computers using these things, there's there it's believed you know, right? no one has a quantum computer yet. That's the reality. Google and IBM are they they want you to think they do. <laughs> They're very close, to be fair, probably, but they don't really have one. And um, but but the intriguing thing is, there's algorithms we can run on quantum computers that are much more efficient than classical computers. Yeah. Um, and maybe the uh, most obvious place to look, like what's something a quantum computer should be able to do better than a classical computer? In the sense of theoretical computer science, right? It can run, it can support algorithms that run more efficiently. Um, the, the first would be quantum simulation, and I won't, I won't go, get too specific about what I mean by this, but uh, you know, you can imagine problems in chemistry where, like, oh, you want to figure out like electron orbitals or something. How does this molecule work? And, uh, that's intrinsically a quantum mechanical problem. So if you wanted to use a computer to try to model it, uh, it's going to be very costly to use a classical computer to model it, exactly because of this cursive dimensionality, right? But if you have a quantum computer, you could represent the, the, the problem much more natively on the quantum machine and, and in principle solve it. So uh, here's a sort of Feynman. This is a big motivation. Uh, like nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical and by golly, it's wonderful problem. Because it's so confused. That's extremely insightful. Like we're all so quantum computers would be awesome to have, but it's definitely not an easy, easy problem. So um, so maybe so that's a little bit like of the that's a, a bit of a motivation coming from like the real world in some sense. The, oh, the real world is quantum mechanical. If you want to simulate it, just use a quantum computer. But there's also just some really like crazy motivation coming from basically pure math that's due to Peter Shore. So in 1994, he, he discovered an algorithm that you can run on a quantum computer that's able to factor integers more quickly than anything we know how to do on a classical computer. Okay. So this, this might sound kind of silly, but it's an important problem in computer science, right? So so I give you an integer n, right? Uh, and I just want to know what are its prime factors. Okay? You know, every integer can be written as a product of prime numbers. And uh, you know, if, if if there's a question here of how we encode n, right? If the size of n is just n itself, then you can find the factors of n quickly. But that's not how we represent numbers in the real world, right? We don't represent numbers with the amount of size proportional to the number itself. It's represented by the amount of size logarithmic in the thing, right? So if I write this in, if I write n, you know, the way we normally write numbers is in base 10, right? So the, the size of n, when I represent it on the computer, is log base 10 of n, right? Okay, on the computer, maybe I'm using binary, so I should use log base 2, right? So what you want is to be able to factor n when you're given n in binary. You want to factor it quickly as the length, as a function of the length. And it's not known how to do this, except Peter Shore figured out how to do it quickly on a quantum computer. <laughs> and that just that blew the lid off the subject, right? Prior to that, like, oh yeah, Feynman, yeah, he's he's thinking about some crazy stuff in the 80s. But when Peter Shore figured this out, everyone woke up. Okay. Because in particular, this this like breaks RSA encryption. Okay, so uh, one of the most common encryption schemes used on my credit card and on the internet is it's called RSA encryption, and uh, the fact that RSA encryption is secure depends on the fact that factoring time, factoring integers should not be easy. <laughs> so, uh, so there's this whole subject now of what's called post-quantum cryptography, where uh, people want to define, like, construct new crypto systems that are secure, even if you know, there's a bad guy in the world who has a quantum computer. So, interesting subject. Um, okay, so that's the fuss. There's a couple motivations. Is there a question? Right, anyone? No? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you tested the uh, machine of the future. Yes. Uh, as compared to the one that we're talking about right now, this is still like this. These new computers are going to be very fast. Yes. Right. So that means, um, like, uh, we're going to be building up a lot. Uh, um, thinking like, uh, how safe is it? How safe? Because the, I mean, it's, it's moving fast, building up a lot of, um, you know, bits. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking, for, is, is I think it be built with a cooling system. Absolutely, absolutely. Like all these things have to be very cold. Safe, you know. That's yes. So 
Uh, it, even if we have real world quantum computers in the next 10 years, they're going to be like computers were 100 years ago. They're going to fill this room. They're going to be massive. They'll require massive cooling systems because the control quantum mechanics at the level of control you need to build a quantum computer, you have to make sure the system's very stable and not, not noisy. And that is why you need to make things cold. And it's also why you have to deal with what, what's called error correction. Error so, correction. Yeah, so, uh, so we will not have quantum computers in our pockets probably in 500 years. I would be confident to say that. But I could be wrong. I'd be happy to be wrong about that. Yeah, that's a question. Yeah. So you say that Peter Shaw gave us the quantum algorithm for factoring the passwords, uh, for factoring uh, integers. Yeah. And the only thing that is protecting us so far from our RSA encryption being broken is the fact that we don't have the hardware. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You know, some people think, well, maybe NSA does. <laughs> I don't think that. I don't think they do. I think if NSA had quantum computers um, that were able to factor large integers, uh, then the world would know. So but you have to look at how they manage to open those phones. You know, when they're well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they probably have other backdoors for for, for, for for somehow less interesting scientific reasons and uh, more human reasons, right? So uh, because they're able to pay off. Something. I don't know, just uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So uh, so this is something to look forward to. Uh, you know, having all of our sensitive data hacked. Um, so <laughs> that'll be fun. Uh, no, but things will get secure. You know, people have already figured out pretty convincing uh, quantum secure crypto systems. And in particular, they don't require right. So you you just need a different way to make things secure on my phone that doesn't require quantum computing. And people have discovered those. And of course, we don't have a proof that a quantum computer can't break them, but we don't have any ideas. So, uh, so there's been a lot of progress on that. And like NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has just, they're in the final stages now of approving certain post-quantum uh, crypto systems. So. OK, so, so now let me address the elephant in the room, which is how are we actually going to do all this? So far, this has all been theory. And the honest answer is, I don't know. I am not an engineer, I'm not a physicist, I'm just a math person, I'm a topologist. Um, and, uh, but you know, you need hardware, right? How do you actually realize a, a, a qubit is an abstraction? How do you physically build one in our reality? Just like a bit is an abstraction, but they are represented by transistors, right? So we need some kind of analog of that. And uh, there's a bunch of approaches and all of them are compelling for different reasons, okay? so. Google and IBM are using superconductors. Don't ask me what a superconductor is. I don't know. Um, uh, Quantinuum, formerly Honeywell, or they're using trapped ions. I kind of know what that is, I guess. Um, you can ask me later. <laughs> uh, uh, quantum optics is another way. So you have like lasers and mirrors and stuff, uh, but it's quantum. And uh, another is quantum annealing. This is what D-Wave's doing, kind of up in the, the Toronto area. And uh, maybe the, the biggest, uh, that maybe the grandest vision here is Microsoft's, uh, I would say, which will use topology, something called my amount of zero modes. But I must stress, all four of these, they've actually realized qubits. They have them in their laboratories. They have quantum computers. You know, so Google and IBM, they have their superconducting qubits that they have like a quantum computer that has like 500 of them. That's pretty good, right? Eventually, we'll want thousands of them, millions of them, so we can do cool calculations. Microsoft has zero qubits. But it's because they're trying to bake in all the topology and the quantum error correction at the level of the hardware. So like it's a much harder problem to even get one qubit. But presumably, once they're able to get one, they'll be able to scale up much more quickly than these other things. All right. That's just that's the hope. Yeah. I'm definitely on their side, <laughs> but I'm rooting for them. But I, I don't I don't work for Microsoft anymore. But, but the fact that they're using topology at the hardware level is very cool. So um, and then there's other ways. I, I don't really I'm not an expert on the, the hardware. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I keep alluding to this. What, so what does topology have to do with any of this? And um, it kind of gets to the question I had a moment ago, uh, which is, well, these computers, do you need to make them really cold? And, and the answer is yes, right? So, so quantum mechanics being an intrinsically probabilistic thing, what goes along with that is that it's also like intrinsically very noisy. Okay, so you can imagine as a thought experiment, 
Forget quantum for a second. What if you had a you had a computer? So what does a computer consist of? It's got a memory, and then it's got like a CPU, which is able to like implement instructions to manipulate that memory, right? And the CPU will have things like you know these physical things that implement those AND gates and OR gates and NOT gates that are happening. And um, but the thought experiment here is, well, what if the memory in your computer was not stable? What if mistakes happen in the memory? So you're trying, you have, you, you load a problem into the computer and you say, okay, let me start computing on this. But, but the computer is screwing up the memory while you're doing it. So can you, can you fix this? Can you, can you make your, is your computer even useful still? And the answer is yes. And this is where, where error correction comes in. So the error correction is a subject that's important even classically. Uh, now, maybe realistically, as far as I'm aware, uh, all of our transistors on all of our phones and on our laptops and stuff, they're, they're so good, they're basically perfect. They don't make mistakes. Your, your memory on your computer almost never makes mistakes. So when your computer's running code, it almost never has to do error correction. Where error correction does come up classically is in networking and wireless transmissions. Right? So if I'm trying to send a signal from this computer to the Wi-Fi somewhere here, uh, uh, then uh, that has to go over the air and it's, you're sending some classical signal like a radio wave or something, right? That microwave or something that uh, is an analog classical signal and it has to be get, get converted back to bits when it gets to wherever it's going and mistakes could happen. So, so you use error correcting codes to make sure that if, if mistakes do happen, then well, as long as not too many mistakes happen, then the information you're trying to relay is not corrupted and you can decode the errors. So that all happens classically. And on a quantum computer, we definitely have to do that. Okay, so on a quantum computer, you, you, you can have a, right, you have a quantum memory in the sense that you have an n qubit quantum memory in the way I defined earlier. Uh, if it's a real world quantum memory, then it's gonna be noisy. So the qubits, like, like you might shake the table, right? If you, if you shake your phone, the transistors aren't gonna screw up. But if you shake your quantum computer, the, the qubits won't get screwed up. So you need to be able to perform what's called quantum error correction on your, net, on your memory. Okay. So that's the warm up. That all sounds kind of complicated, but uh, it was kind of figured out in the 90s that, well, theoretically, there is a, a decent theory of quantum error correction. Okay, so if your memory is not stable, you can at least, like, as long as you make it, you can always make the memory bigger and then encode the information in a redundant way that as long as not too many mistakes happen, you can fix it. So, so that's the warm up. <laughs> we think we kind of understand how that works, although I must want to stress it hasn't really been achieved. Well, I'll say something about it later in the talk. Whether whether this has happened yet in the real world with real world quantum computers is a little bit up in the air. But the bigger problem is what's called fault tolerance. So now, imagine not only your memory is bad, but your CPU is bad, right? So you're supposed to implement. This is even classically. This would be horrible, right? You have to implement AND gates and OR gates on the memory and start doing calculations. But what if the AND gates and OR gates are getting screwed up? Moreover, the error correction you use has to use AND gates and OR gates and stuff. So if you're going to try to correct errors, you have to do calculations, computations to do that. And if the computations are themselves a source of noise, how do you correct errors if the error correction process itself introduces the noise? That sounds horrible. And it is, but there's some theory to believe that it should be an achievable something, it's an issue we should be able to get over. Okay, it's called the threshold. Um, and, and this, this problem I'm describing is called the fault tolerance problem. So, so this is, you know, uh, it's like quantum memory, like unstable quantum memory. Yeah, okay, we kind of know how to deal with that, but like unstable quantum memory and also not having, being able to implement the calculations you want exactly, that just makes it really hard. So, um, okay, and uh, I'm supposed to answer this question. What does topology have to do with all of this? And uh, the answer is that, like, topology, you know, it's maybe not so surprising in the sense that what is topology all about? It's about studying, like, spaces or geometric objects, but you're allowed to deform them, right? You want to understand, like, what are the properties of a, of a system of a mathematical object that are preserved when you start deforming the object in various ways. So, and you can think of like the, the memory of the, your quantum computer as like your object, and if it's being hit with noise, that's like deforming the memory. So, so topology, you know, it's not so wild to think of something. Like so, uh, but I'm going to give you a very specific example. So, um, are there any questions?
I guess there's pizza. Should I let people get pizza? Or, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, oh, keep going. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so let me say a little something about topology first, and then I'll, I'll talk about the core code. So, uh, and I'm 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 just going to stick to knot theory for this talk. So, uh, so in knot theory, you study knots, right? So what the knot? It's a it's an embedded copy of the circle inside a three-dimensional space, right? And uh, here's a bunch of examples, right? And now uh, we're actually, we usually represent them exactly like this, right? When we think of mathematically or as like a computational problem, if I had an actual knot, right? I don't know, this cable down here, I could put the cable on the table here and look down at it, and it would be a picture just like one of those things. Right? So this is a decent representation of knots. And moreover, these are combinatorial data, right? Like you can move these things around and stuff, but um, how you, I can describe something like this as ugly as it is, I can describe it to a computer. After all, it's all projected, right? <laughs> it's projected from the computer. So, uh, uh, so a basic problem in topology, in knot theory specifically, is to understand well, if I have two different pictures of knots, say this one and this one, can I figure out whether they represent the same knot? Right, because knots are allowed to wiggle them around and stuff, right? And uh, this one turns out to actually be equivalent to that one. Okay. So this is called the unknot. This is like the stupid knot where like you don't actually do anything. You just kind of take your rope and you glue the two ends together and you put it on a table, and it's a perfect circle. It's not knotted up at all, right? So it's called the unknot. And but there's infinitely many representations of the unknot. For example, that okay. I could take that circle of rope and just mess it up without tying any actual knots in it, they can look like that, but it can be untangled. Whereas something like this, you can, no matter how long you start trying to untangle it, you'll never make it look like that. This is called the truckload knot. But like this thing is equivalent to that thing. For example. And now you know mathematicians like to like classify knots. So yeah, these are all the knots, uh, all the knots that can be represented with that most what are called the eight crossings. So you can ask for Right. If you have a really big knot, it's possible there's no way to represent it by, with something that only has like six crosses, right? Uh, so, so this is just a table that people have essentially computed by brute force over the years that classifies all the knots up to six crosses. This is from Rolfson's textbook from the 60s, 70s. Uh, so, um, and maybe a point to make here is that everything I'm describing is like it's interesting just as a mathematical problem to understand knots. But it's, it's, it's even more exciting, I would say, when you think about it from the perspective of computer science. Because like, we don't just want to decide, we don't just want some abstract mathematical theory to decide whether this is equivalent to that. We ideally like an algorithm that we can run on our computer that will tell me whether or not these are the same. And even better, we, like, we don't know if this is possible, we'd like an algorithm that is efficient. So it's an open question whether there's an efficient algorithm to decide whether two knots are equivalent. And uh, it, this is a little bit out of left field, but I'll just say no. It's not a crazy question to think that maybe there's a quantum algorithm to unlock things or decide things are equivalent. So, um, so before I really tie things together, uh, the topology and the quantum computing, uh, I want to quickly review something called TQFT. I, I apologize for the acronym there. It's a topological quantum field theory. So it sounds like physics mumbo jumbo, but it's actually a rigorously defined mathematical structure. And uh, I'm not going to give you the, the full definition, but uh, it, it's like the key mathematical idea that like allows us to use topology in quantum computation. Um, so, so what is this? I'm gonna, I'll only talk about what are called three-dimensional TQFTs. You can have them in other dimensions as well. Um, and I'll just kind of define it by what it does as opposed to what it actually is. So it's basically some type of quantum theory that, means, that is described purely by topological phenomena in three dimensions. Okay. So, so uh, in particular, this TQ, these TQFTs come with particles called anions. And you should think of the TQFT as saying it's a recipe for how to set up certain physical systems on surfaces, like the surface of this table or the surface of a donut or a higher genus surface. And then what we're allowed to do is put particles on these surfaces, these are called anions, and move them around and stuff. And uh, uh, so here's an example. Like at time zero, here's a genus three surface. And you can imagine you have some particles, these anions, 
And then in time, I'm going to start moving them around each other on the surface. And then I might even deform the topology of this thing to get a bigger surface and then like bring stuff up some more. And so this is the kind of operations you can, if, if the, the, the DQFT is telling you like what the states are on these different surfaces. And then these, these, these operations of moving the particles around on the surface are telling you something about how time evolution behaves. So, um, yeah, so and the point of the, all this is it, it's supposed to only depend on the topology of what's going on here, not the geometry. So uh, I, I, that all sounds very mushy, I must admit, the way I've described this. But like, it, there's relatively rigorous ways that don't take too much uh, uh, holding your breath to actually like see that you can define such things. And in fact, you can define them with like fairly combinatorial data. So there's lots of different TQFTs. I want to stress that, even in dimension three. It's an interesting mathematical problem to classify them. It's basically a problem of algebra. Um, so, uh, but uh, for, for our purposes, uh, what I want to observe is that uh, if I have, so these particles, I keep calling them, they're, they're anions. They're somehow, they're part of the data of the TQFT. If I have uh, a particle, an anion, and a knot, then there's something I can do with the TQFT to get myself an invariant of the knot. So what it means is there's something I can do with the TQFT and that thing to, to learn something about the knot. And let me be a little bit more specific here. So, uh, well, I will in a second here, but I, if, if this means anything to you, like examples of this, uh, most of the most interesting examples of this come from uh, things involving what's called the Jones polynomial, uh, because you know you that's fine, uh, but uh, the, uh, Maybe even zooming out a little bit more, like there's constructions of TQFTs that come from finite group theory and uh, also come from uh, semi simple the algebras. Okay. Really quantum deprecations of them, whatever that means. But uh, uh, so, and somehow the goal, what will be the goal eventually, is to understand these TQFTs um, and how they relate to quantum computing. So, let me explain for a second though what I mean by non invariant. Um, this is an example. It's, I'm calling it the Jones polynomial. Strictly speaking, it's not something affiliated called the Hoffman factor. It's basically the same thing. So, so there's a lot going on right here. But K is supposed to be a picture of a knot, like one of those things I had on the slide a couple of pages back. And then this is telling you a recursive procedure to write down a polynomial with integer coefficients in the variable a and a inverse. Uh, that that polynomial using some rules like oh, anytime you see a crossing, you can get rid of it. Uh, in the two different ways, and you have some recursive formula for how the invariant is defined. And uh, it, what's, what's really cool is that the, this, this formula, and it's a little bit of a lie, but it's basically that this thing is an invariant. It says that you have two different diagrams of K, right? Because you have to pick a picture of K. You have to put the K on the table and apply this algorithm to, to compute it. But if I picked K up off the table and mushed it around and put it back down, I got another picture, and I did the same algorithm, I get the same answer. That's what I mean by this an invariant. It doesn't, you know, the way I compute it depends on the representation of K, but the answer I get when I'm done is just. So, so this is not exactly a TQFT invariant, but it's very closely related. So, uh, so what we can do now, this is like a, this is an invariant. Of, it's a weird thing. It's a polynomial in this variable A and A inverse. That that polynomial is in a topological invariant of K. That's like kind of weird, but. Uh, what you could do in particular is like just pick a pick a complex number, pick your favorite complex number. And well, that's a slight lie. Uh, I'm going to make you pick a complex number that's a good e. So for example, e to the two pi i over five. Okay. So if you plug in that number to this polynomial, well, that because the polynomial itself was an invariant, the evaluation of the polynomial at that number also is invariant. And it's those types of numbers that these uh, these crazy TQFTs are giving. Okay. Well, that's what I had in mind. So, um, right, so that's the intro. When, when do I stop? <laughs> Soon? Okay. So uh, let me show you the Toric code, and then uh, we'll, we'll call it a day. So um, so I, at one point, I called this Kataya's million dollar idea. This is done in 1997. It has something to do with the porous, which is like the surface of it up there. And, uh, but I really think it's probably safe to call it a billion dollar idea. Uh, 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 Everyone implements surface code. It doesn't matter what hardware you're using. You're you're implementing the or the Toric code. So uh, uh, so what is it? So I, I don't want to keep you too late. So uh, very roughly, what's going on is you make a grid, okay, 
And this grid, we're going to think of as having periodic boundary conditions. So this edge is this edge, and this edge is this edge. So if you blew that up, what we're getting is a grid on the forest. And then what we do is we put a qubit in the middle of every edge. Okay, so uh, if this is, you know, if this is a k by k grid, we'll have two k squared many qubits. Okay, so you want to think of those as physical qubits. They're your actual hardware. And now we're going to, we're going to define a subspace of those qubits, and that will be our quantum error correction code space. Okay, so what that means is we're not going to allow arbitrary, we don't want to compute with arbitrary configurations of the qubits. We only want to pick a subspace of the qubits and use that to compute with because it will have good error correction properties. Okay. Well, then, how are we deciding what the subspace? I mean, what's. Yeah, there's a whole art to figuring out, like, how do you build good subspaces? There's there's kind of two important parameters. There's there's the there's the weight, which is telling you like, okay, you yeah you you have a thousand classical you have a thousand qubits, but like you like if you have a thousand qubits, you you should be able to encode some large fraction of logical qubits into the physical qubits. So that's one of the parameters, and then the other is called the, the distance, and that's the key thing, and it's kind of telling you how many qubits can you make a mistake on but still see that you made a mistake and correct it. So those are the, roughly the two things you're aiming for, the rate and the distance. So uh, I could say more about that, but so, so the way he defines, kind of defines this code space, it's gonna be a subspace of this, is using what are called uh, star and plaquette operators. And so a plaquette operator, what it looks like is there's a specific unitary matrix called the Pauli Z matrix, and what you do is you apply it to all four of these. Uh, qubits on the edges around that plaquette. And then the, the star operator, you apply the poly X matrix to all four of the qubits around the star, around a vertex. And then what you do is you say, we're not going to look at all states. We're only going to look at the states in here that when I apply any of these operators to them, you just get that state back. So this is what's called a stabilizer code because you're looking for the states that are stable under the application of these operators. Right? We're saying, we're basically saying we want the states that are plus one eigenvectors of these operators. And this is a pretty good quantum map. I, I won't be precise about it, but I, I, I can tell you more after. So, um, so this is a error correction code. And what's really cool about this is not only is it an error correction code, it comes with intrinsically fault tolerant operations in the sense that there's things you can do uh, that, um, like, you can introduce particles, anions, and move them around on this thing and use that to manipulate information. And the, the way you move these things around, like a priori, the way it affects the code space could depend on the geometry of how you move things around, but it turns out not to. It only depends on the topology. So this is essentially realizing a key connection. Okay. Now, uh, the good news is that uh, this is implementing a TQFT, and what Katayev was arguing back in 1997 was something much more general. I mean, this construction alone, like, like you might get a Nobel Prize just for this, like, direct construction if like it gets implemented someday. But uh, the uh, what he did, he had a much grander vision in fact, which is that well anytime you use a quantum computer, uh, you build a quantum computer where you have a code, use an error correcting code that has something to do with the TQFT, then in fact it comes with a bunch of protected operations, like unitary gates, quantum gates you can perform that are themselves fault tolerant. So uh, that's the magic. The bad news is those gates aren't very interesting, but it's work. Okay. So, uh, so you can't build a fully programmable quantum computer using Toric code, even though you can get a decent memory out of it. Okay. So now there's other things you can do using other TQFTs, and this is what Friedman, Larson, and Lang proved back in 2002. This is Mike Friedman. Um, he he's been he ran Microsoft Station View for a long time, uh, basically trying to realize this vision. Uh, they haven't got the hardware yet, <laughs> but they've done a lot of really cool math in the last 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a whole story here. I don't want to hold you up too much, but um, let me show some recent news. We'll stop here. So uh, the first is that Google, uh, well, let's see, February, a nature paper, where they argued that they were able to implement the Torque code on their machine. And that's cool. That in itself is cool. But the key word here is scalability. What you want is to be able to, as you make your quantum memory big, as you add more and more qubits to the system, you, you want to build, right, these quantum codes depend on how many qubits you have. And you want the quantum code to get better and better as you add more and more qubits. And they argue that that's the case. Okay. These are just pretty pictures. You don't have to do. So, but 
Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I don't really think we're going to hold it. So, <laughs> uh, it's, I don't need to, right? Like this, there's this, it's this interesting moment. I'm very much an academic, right? But like these, these corporate guys, like they have a lot of like external motivation to like do things first, which like, okay, like, so they'll stake this claim and say, oh, we did it, we did it first. And then like, it'll get shot down by academics like two years later. But I don't hold that, I don't hold a grudge with them. It makes it interesting. There's kind of this, this battle. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, so they did that. And then uh, another thing to plug maybe is that uh, the stuff with these enions, what's important about them is that you can like move them around in different ways and like moving them this way will affect the transformation that's different from moving them that way. That's just in theory, but uh, the, the physics of that has been known in theory since the 80s, but it was only a couple of years ago that we were directly able to measure, not me, but uh, people at Purdue were able to directly measure uh, any of them. So that, that was pretty cool. But th they were doing something that was kind of like the Torah code. And like I said, the Torah code is not universal. It's not universal. So it's like a good memory, but it's not a, it's not good for a fully programmable computer. And uh, the somewhat different direction is like this year, people simulated TQFTs with not a union anyons, which are the kinds of things you need to have a fully programmable computer. It's not sufficient, but it's necessary. And uh, this was done by, uh, well, it's Continuum there at AUC Honeywell. Uh, they, they basically simulated a TQFT on their quantum computer, which has nothing to do with topology. Their quantum computer uses trap ions. Okay. So, here, what they were essentially doing was staking a claim and saying, look, Microsoft, it's kind of a big Microsoft. Microsoft's been trying to build these non abelian anions for a long time, but they're trying to do it using condensed matter physics for good reason. What these guys are just teasing them a little bit and saying, well, look, we were able to simulate them on our quantum computer. That's nothing to do with condensed matter physics. And so we claim we got the first non abelian anion. And I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe. But it's definitely very cool. I don't want to undersell it. It's very cool. but. In some sense, it's not implementing error correction, what these guys are doing. It's just kind of staking a claim. It's basically asserting that it's, it's a chance for Continuum to assert that their computer is at least strong enough uh, to be able to see what these things. Uh, so maybe I will stop there, and we can have pizza or whatever. Take questions. So, thanks for watching.